What happens in Washington affects the arts community in ways that a lot of folks uh, don't realize. And this goes beyond direct public funding. We're talking about a wide range of decisions that affect the lives of creators. This is stuff, uh, everything from economic issues to basic day-to-day -day concerns like healthcare, transportation, housing, and the role of arts in education. The federal government is seeking to spur and engage artists' stakeholders, including musicians, in decisions about how neighborhoods and metro areas should grow and change. We're pleased to welcome our panel of experts who will talk about how that might be accomplished even in difficult economic times. Let's welcome them to the stage. Good morning, good morning. So we thought, uh, you know, if you're going to do a policy panel at 9.15 in the morning, the uh, way to, to bring the early crowd is to call it an extravaganza. That is uh, a quasi-tongue-in-cheek uh, panel name. You know, we like to say that we're good at naming children and cats, but, you know, panels, we need, need some work. But we're really excited, um, you know, to have these, these speakers with us today, and, and Casey kind of gave a, a pretty good overview, or a very good overview, of kind of what we're doing today in, in terms of the programming of the conference. Uh, you know, one of the things we've said for a long time is that, you know, as critical and important uh, as, as the work done uh, by the National Endowment of the Arts or by the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, it's, it's just so critical that we don't allow ourselves as advocates for the arts to allow, uh, you know, a 6% increase or decrease to be some sort of metric for cultural policy. You know, there's so many more issues that go on in terms of livelihood of musicians, in terms of the experience of music consumers, in terms of what happens with our com uh, communities and infrastructure. So today's conversation, uh, just to start off, is to highlight uh, just a couple of interesting pieces of work that we uh, have been following closely, that we're excited about, that we want you to know more about, uh, and, and to really uh, try to kind of increase the dialogue and, and make sure people are aware of what's going on. So I'm really happy to have Candace and Dan uh, with us this morning. While we start with Candace, uh, Candace Katz is the Deputy Director of the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities. Uh, it's an advisory group, uh, you know, for the administration for the White House that brings together experts, a wide range of cultural leaders, and in particular, uh, they uh, this May released uh, what we think is one of the most interesting uh, and, and sort of long-awaited reports on the role of arts and education. And so, Candace, I'd love uh, for you to talk a little bit about the role of the committee and then specifically dig into the report and, um, you know, what you all found and kind of where that conversation is going. Well, thank you very much. I'm very, very honored to be here to talk about our education report. Now, to start, the President's Committee is a committee which was started in 1982 and serves every administration. It's made up of the heads of each of the agencies that has a cultural component, like education and the State Department and, of course, the National Endowment for the Arts and private members appointed by each president. And we're very honored to have a stellar group um, Yo-Yo Ma is our chief musician. Uh, there's architect Tom Main and actors, Forrest, uh, Forrest Whitaker, Alfre Woodard, Kerry Washington, Sarah Jessica Parker, Anna Wintour, um, George C. Wolf. Uh, we just have a, an amazing group of, of artists on our committee advising us on policy. And of course, when they come together with the heads of the federal agencies, there's a great synergy and excitement. And one of the things that um, uh, the president, the administration, asked us to do was look into arts education. And uh, over 18 months, we uh, researched and uh, studied all the um, documents in the last decade because there's been no federal report. And we came up in May of 2011 with this report called Reinvesting in Arts Education, Winning America's Future through creative schools. And uh, Sandra Rupert at the Arts Education Partnership was kind enough to allow us to uh, introduce the report there. And uh, we found some really positive and wonderful things about education, and also some needs that really, really need to be met in the next few years. Um, the positive things we found is that, oh, I should say, I'm sorry, this was funded by the Knight Foundation. Um, 
One of the positive things we found is that art education is really good for students. And why should you be interested in this, in addition to your families and friends and loved ones? Um, you want the next generation of students to love music. I think they will anyhow, but they'll have a broader and a deeper appreciation if they're taught in the schools. So one thing we found was that um, education in all the arts, but music particularly, um, helps students in all of their other academic subjects. And as opposed to the drill and skill kind of education, which is supposed to be focused on reading and math, actually an arts enriched education is much more effective than um, a focus, a very narrow focus. And I think that our Department of Education, of course, our president believes that. Uh, the introduction to this uh, report is by uh, Secretary of Education Arne Duncan. He saw what happened in the Chicago schools uh, with that wonderful organization, CAPE. Uh, for example, in the report you can find that the 19 schools that are CAPE schools and have arts integration in the schools scored better on all the achievement tests than other schools in the district. So there's a, uh, an additional benefit besides just learning music. Um, we found that um, over time, these, um, these um, achievements stay with students. So there's a very famous report cited here by James Catterall that followed a cohort of 25,000 students. Um, and over time, the, the ones that had an arts enriched education uh, did better in all their subjects. And he looked at these, this cohort again 10 years after they graduated high school and found they did better in their college or their career. They were more likely to vote or volunteer. These benefits stayed with them for their whole lives. And uh, not only that, but the benefits accrued to disadvantaged students, that is students on free or reduced lunch, even more than for students who didn't have this, um, this uh, disadvantage of being from a low-income household. So um, finally, I wanted to say that we found that there are so many ways to deliver the arts in schools. There is the art specialist and who is trained in teaching an art and teaches sequentially uh, to art standards. There's the classroom teacher, and especially in middle and um, Elementary schools, it's very important that this teacher know how to introduce arts to the classroom. And finally, there's the teaching artist. And I wonder how many of you have been teaching artists here? Aha. Uh -huh. And you know that a teaching artist uh, brings a fresh perspective, a project-based outlook. And if that artist can be embedded in the schools, work with the classroom teachers, then it's triply effective. We found that this word that's been tossed around a lot lately, arts integration, was incredibly helpful in turning around schools. It's, that means teaching in the arts, but also through the arts and other subjects. It helped collabor collaboration among teachers, it helped student engagement, it helped achievement in all areas. So that's something that this report uh, looks at a lot. If you guys have any examples of where art or music turned around a school or was very, very effective in helping attendance or graduation or engagement of students and teachers. I'd love to hear about it after or during. Thank you. Kim, thank you. And we are going to post on the uh, FMC uh, 11 hashtag Twitter feed a link to the report. Um, for those of you who are interested in, in arts education, I certainly uh, highly recommend it. Uh, and it's, I think, particularly important because we're likely moving into uh, a period of time where uh, Congress and the administration are going to be rethinking um, the K-12 authorization legislation. and. I think it's, it's particularly important to get some data and metrics into that conversation early about the role of arts and education and see what connections can be drawn and should be drawn. Uh, I think it's in all of our experience that um, when you talk about uh, local arts communities, local cultural communities, uh, to strengthen the connections between uh, education and those communities is vital. Uh, certainly the interest is there and uh, there's a certain extent that policy can play a role there and certainly resources and funding can play a role there. Uh, so thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to turn out to Dan Lurie. And Dan is the senior advisor. I, I always botch titles. The senior advisor to NEA Chairman Rocco Landsman, and he's also the director of strategic partnerships at the National Endowment of the Arts. 
Uh, last year, many of you had the opportunity to see a keynote presentation from uh, Deputy Secretary Ron Sims uh, at, at the time from Department of Housing and Urban Development. And um, I think a lot of us were moved by uh, Deputy Secretary Sims' uh, description of, of the importance of intentional arts and culture strategies as a real driver of economic development and, and kind of the connection between healthy local economies and really thoughtful, intentional uh, strategies. Uh, I think Dan is um, really doing uh, pretty amazing work in terms of trying to broaden that out and really look at partnerships within the government, again, with the idea that we don't, you know, we need to transcend the traditional silos, you know, where, where agencies aren't talking to each other in terms of the uh, impact that their policies have on arts and culture. So I'd like for Dan to talk a little bit about your work and specifically how this community is engaging and really can engage more uh, and really be active partners in the stuff that you guys are doing. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, first, thank you for having me here. FMC is uh, an organization that, as you mentioned, HUD was a partner with. NEA obviously has great relationships with, so I think it's pretty exciting that you're getting administration folks here and really having a broad conversation about uh, where this administration, where the country is going on these, on these big policy issues. Um, I'll tell you a bit about my, my, my work, and I'm actually new to the National Endowment for the Arts, to NEA. Uh, I came from HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development, uh, another federal agency, uh, that, uh, whose secretary and, and deputy secretary uh, both came from communities, Seattle and New York, respectively, where they understood intuitively the role that arts and culture play in, a, in the health of a neighborhood and the health of a city and region. Uh, and so the conversations of, I'm sorry, the conversations around these issues were uh, somewhat ill-formed from a policy perspective, but uh, nonetheless had a lot of energy behind them. And I was one of the, a part of the team at HUD that really kind of stood up these issues and engaged with Michael and FMC uh, and Rocco, the chairman of the NEA, to, uh, to see where there was an appetite to have the federal government play more of a leadership role. And now at NEA, that, that is my job. Uh, so so in, a, in, a, in a, a very pithy way, what I'm looking at is, and what the NEA team are looking at is, uh, what impact do artists have on the life and uh, the resiliency of a city, and, and what role does the city and, and its functions play in the life of an artist? Um, and the, in a lot of ways, these are kind of conversations of the first impression for the federal government. Uh, we have a lot of good information about what works and what doesn't work in community development. We don't have as much good information and as much direct analytical experience around uh, the artist's uh, impact there. And so one of the things I'm doing is working with the research team at NEA and federal partners, including HUD, the Department of Education, Department of Commerce, um, uh, Department of Transportation, to look at kind of the big research apparatus of the federal government and how it can in figure out some of these intersections and then stand up best practices. Uh, but fundamental to this work is really a recognition that what you all do, musicians, artists generally, and arts organizations that support musicians and, and artists are uh, key to the, the vitality and the economic health of a city and a town. Uh, this work is certainly not limited to, to the urban sector. Um, and so, uh, this is something that I feel very passionately about. I think that um, one of the things that separates our country from others is, is the role that we all play in this broader conversation um, and, and coming up with better tools to support what you're doing and really integrating what you do into the, the kind of decision making that happens uh, on a regular basis in cities and regions I think is, is crucial to making this all work. Uh, and uh, as Michael said a few days ago, we were talking in a similar conversation. Uh, the music community, artists in particular, have traditionally not seen themselves as really central players in these conversations. And I think one of the things that in my small way I'd like to do is really show that that is uh, something that needs to change. And uh, conversely, that the decision makers in city government, state government, and federal government outside of the traditional art sector really need to have musicians at the table uh, and, and account for them in decision making. And I think we're seeing a, a, a really large appetite for that. Um, and everything from including artists in, in the administration's conversations all the way down to mayors and, and county leaders and others who, who, uh, who really understand the dynamic value you guys add to, uh, to, to their communities. Uh, so I think coming forward, there are, there are a number of initiatives that will play out. I think two that I'd like to highlight in particular, uh, one is an, uh, a NEA-led but not funded effort called Art Place which just launched a few weeks ago. Some of you may have heard about this. 
Uh, it is a attempt to uh, have a number of national foundations and local foundations, philanthropic foundations, fund what's called creative placemaking. So these kind of, how do you, uh, how do you create better linkages between community development forces and arts and culture? Uh, and it's a really neat project. There are about uh, 30 different efforts underway across the country, and it's growing by the day. Uh, actually, the next round of funding uh, will close in November, so I'm happy to talk offline or, or online about how one could get involved in that. But they are, uh, these foundations are foundations that really, un again, understand these intersections and the power behind them, but are looking to test out some innovative approaches. And so you'll, there's a range of, of initiatives, uh, everything from uh, affordable housing projects for artists all the way up to civic engagement tools that are going to really drive new conversations across regions. Um, another uh, effort is an NEA-led and funded project called Our Town which uh, is now in year two, and that is an attempt, a similar approach to kind of creative placemaking, and it's an attempt to, uh, to engage uh, the infrastructure side of the conversation, uh, the transportation, housing, land use side of it, and really look at how can uh, the NEA seed some, some innovative approaches to engaging artists in the broader conversations around community development. These are two very related, although uh, separate projects that I think are part of the, the chairman's perspective that NEA is an important leader and uh, almost a quarterback of this conversation, but this, as Michael kind of indicated, this is not something that we can just kind of fund our way towards, that we really need to start the conversation, catalyze it in, in, in ways stand up what works, uh, identify the barriers to making this happen, but that we're not going to have a uh, uh, one, st one, uh, one solution fits all approach to how this can happen. We really need to make sure that this is locally driven work, that the work, the, the work that you're doing is connected to the needs of your community, which are gonna vary across the country, but that the federal government is providing the resources and, and getting out of the way where necessary to make sure that you uh, that you guys are, are engaged and deeply part of the conversations about where your cities and towns are going. Dan, thank you. And again, we'll post uh, on our Twitter feed some links to the, uh, yeah. the grant uh, cycles, processes that you referred to. Um, I don't know, is it, is it too early for questions? Is anybody in a question mode yet, or are we gonna work our way into questions? We have time for one or two if anybody, would, uh, if anybody has anything they'd like to ask. We have, uh, Joel, do you have a question down front? So, so much I found, I'm, I'm involved in a, in a space just here in the D.C. area that's involved in, com it's primarily almost a community development. The organization behind it is, is community development. And I find, uh, you know, how to really engage because so much of arts, of, of arts and whatever, having arts and a, and a music community in this, in, in any particular area is like, you know, is there affordable housing for artists? Is there a, a transportation system that supports nightlife? Uh, you know, th those are reasonable things, but, uh, you know, a lot of times it seems like there's, you know, particularly in the local area, uh, it gets, you know, on, on this almost block by block basis that governments in, in DC, particularly where we're, we're located, just inside DC, it, 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 it gets into sort of little, you know, little turfs of little uh, politicians out, out there in the field, and just to try to get, you know, attention and to really, if there were like a really heavily stated national policy that basically sort of like, like Austin, like let's have, let's have cities get out of the artist's way to, to some extent in terms of zoning, in terms of this and that, you know, what, what can we do to encourage uh, our local communities to really, to, to sort of, you know, n not necessarily support, but at least let arts be in terms of r regulation and, you know, noise regulation like we have in DC that's horrible or, or other things. And I'll, I'll take whatever you can come up with on that. Uh, that's a great question, uh, and I come uh, from Chicago, where uh, a lot of these challenges are also uh, very much there, especially in the music community. Um, so, a couple answers. One, I think I think your framing is exactly right. That uh, that 
too often these issues come down to kind of block by block, if not business by business disputes, neighbors against venues. Um, I think one uh, approach, if not solution, is to make sure that that the community is the community is organized. Uh, that that it's not uh, neighbors to venues, but music community to venues to city council to council members to mayor. Uh, I think the more organized you can be, the more effective you will be. This the uh, again speaking to the music community context here. Uh, the uh, if you are speaking as a, as one or two, you're much less effective than a, a broader group. Similarly, uh, I think the mayor's office, I think uh, the regional governments, the, the, the decision makers that really impact how transportation funding gets allocated, um, where federal dollars flow, uh, I think is extremely important to be at least aware and engaged in how that conversation is going, if not outright participating in it. Um, and so members of Congress clearly need to hear about this. And I know in DC that's a little more complicated, um, but I think that, uh, that 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 kind of those kind of basic political organizing skills I think are incredibly uh, productive and too often I think uh, seen as not something that artists need to be doing that that the, the kind of politics and the rough and tumble is for someone else um, and I think that that has proven unfortunate I know FMC is kind of premised on the basis that that's not true uh, but uh, so I think from a basic standpoint there's that I think that uh, that said in DC in particular I'm a DC resident as well. Um, I think there is a is a there are a cohort of folks who really do get it, elected and other, um, and I think um, having making sure that the conversation happens outside just the neighborhood, that what happens in Shaw, for example, impacts what happens in Georgetown and vice versa. Obviously, you know, council members like Jack Evans, who have jurisdiction over both those areas, would understand that. But I think too often. Uh, that these are siloed conversations geographically. And so uh, kind of having an appreciation for what happens in each neighborhood as an impact on the broader city and the broader quality of life, I think is, is important. And, and as much as that may be obvious to some of you, I think unfortunately that's, that is not a perspective many people uh, intuitively uh, grasp. I think we have time for one more. Adam, you wanna? The barriers to uh, increase collaboration between government and, and musicians, and that's that's historically been genre. I think that arguably um, punk rock and indie rock and hip hop have been some of the most important cultural cultural movements of the last 50 years, and yet they're um, the least likely to have any kind of institutional support. There are historical reasons for that, of course, but for example, the, the NEA's um, public partici per participation survey um, doesn't map any data for participation in those kinds of popular, um, popular musical forms that are, you know, arguably again the most inherently participatory by their very nature. Um, what are you doing to try to start to map some of that data, some of that activity that's going on in the informal sector, um, and in the commercial sector, and in the the to DIY to be a nonprofit sector and Alternatively, how can we help you um, map that data? Uh, so I, this may sound like a dodge. I truly don't know. I know that uh, the chairman and his research team uh, are fully aware of this problem. And it applies not, of course, just to the music community, but, but across the art sector, that most of the work that we measure tends to be uh, kind of traditional discipline. Um, and and, and the, the kind of tastemakers and the gatekeepers around that have have, uh, have kept it from being a full-on accounting of, of what the sector is doing. Um, so I, I, I don't know the specific strategies around that. Uh, I do know that uh, the kind of, um, I won't call them advocate world, but the, the foundation community, the academic world, the folks who are kind of, who are enlightened around these issues and are trying to move the conversation forward also are tackling this. Uh, so I'll tell you there is a full acknowledgement at the leadership level at NEA that we need to measure this more effectively and more inclusively. Um, and what can you do? I think, um, I think, uh, you know, geez, it's a, it's a, I have lots of ideas. I mean, one is certainly talk to me afterwards and I can get up my information and we can kind of continue the conversation. I think two is make sure that, um, that are, you, are you from DC or are you? Yeah. DC, okay. For those of you who aren't from DC, make sure that this conversation gets extended across the country, that, that le local leadership who may or may not be aware of what's happening in DC, including the national government, federal government, uh, understand the kind of the power and the impact that the the non-traditional, non uh, non nonprofit, but nonetheless very influential uh, music community has, uh, and I think that 
uh, that conversation in many many ways is going to be of the first kind. Um, so you know, there uh, what one of the things I'd love to see NEA figure out is how can we provide some tools so that communities can measure that communities that are strapped for resources and don't have the the time or staff to dedicate to this, but nonetheless see the the problem and would like to do something. I think one of the things. Our posture in general has been, how can we make this an easier conversation for you to have? And so coming up with tools to do that would be great. And any suggestions you have, I'd be happy to hear. And just to, you know, I think build off of Kevin's question, I mean, I think one of the things that's happened in certainly the last 10 years since we've been around at Future Music is, I think we recognize that the era of governing, governing uh, kind of by anecdote and by intuition is over. That we have the ability in this digital age to have all sorts of new metrics and, and think of data and of understanding impacts of policy interventions in ways that just were not possible 10, 15 years ago. And you know what, what I think we observe here in Washington is that policymakers are eager for this data not only because, you know, from a practical matter in terms of the fiscal climate we're in, you have to be able to justify every single dollar of taxpayer money that gets spent, you know, beyond just doing it because it feels right. I also think policymakers understand they have the potential to have, um, you know, really greater tools to understand again the impact of their policy interventions. So I think those conversations are really tough, you know, in terms of figuring out how do you architect them and what does it look like, and you know, meow, meow, meow. Who's but in, who's out? Yeah, but they're happening, you know, in a really big way. So I don't think that's a dodge at all. I mean, I think it's it's you know, uh, that's you better said, but yeah, the the, the, the hunger for data, especially data that is that is uh, that is. Uh, vetted and rigorous, but nonetheless not necessarily from the federal government. So there are a number, and Michael's put me in touch with a few folks who are kind of doing cultural mapping, so looking at what are the assets, uh, infrastructure and other in a community. Uh, that's a, obviously a very, very complicated analysis, but I think uh, in addition to the, the thirst for this, there's also a clear acknowledgement across the board among uh, the research teams in the federal government that we have to start asking the tough questions, and even if we don't have all the answers and we don't have the, the tools right now, we need to start digging, and in so doing, we'll figure out what works, what doesn't work. And that's from my, my, my previous background at HUD, uh, we still have lots and lots of questions about what works and doesn't work in terms of housing investments and broader infrastructure. But, but we've, we've tried a lot, and we know a lot more than we did 20 years ago, and that, those best practices are now emerging, and 20 years from now, I hope we have a similar kind of robust conversation around what works and doesn't work in terms of community investments and, and understanding the role of, of music and artists in community vitality. But, but right now, it's, it is a, a young conversation. Great. And on that note, we have to wrap up. We're out of time. Thank you guys for uh, participating this morning. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Candice. <laughs>